All right, well, it's time for us to cover the Brazilian election. I know you've all been waiting with bated breath, going, Mike, please cover the Brazilian election. Oh, please. I need to know what happened. Mike, please cover it. Well, chat, it's happened. Lula da Silva has won. Lula da Silva has won the first round in Brazil. Now he has a solid lead, but it's not in conceivable that Bolsonaro could stage a comeback. So let's take a look at what happened and uh, we'll talk about it more. In Brazil, the heated presidential election will go to a second round. Former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva failed to secure the majority needed for a victory in the first round. He'll face off against current President Jair Bolsonaro in a runoff on October 30th. So for more on this, we want to bring in uh, Beatriz Correra. She is an international editor for Bando Bandorones. I don't think I said that properly, but I hope you'll forgive me. Bandorones. Um, so let us talk about this really uh, interesting election season. I think a lot of people may not have been following what's going on, except where they're waking up right now. So I want you to set the scene. People would have been familiar with Bolsonaro, right-wing uh, candidate, uh, often compared to Donald Trump. And then this other candidate who was formerly president, who's more of a left-wing candidate. Who are they? What has the campaign been like? And who's supporting the two candidates? Good morning, Emery. Uh, well, basically, it, it was the results are what we were expecting. Uh, the two candidates uh, leading the polls were to a second round. How do Brazilian elections work? Why are there two rounds? Yeah, Brazil, like many countries in Latin America, has a presidential runoff system where basically everybody can run in the first round. And if somebody gets an absolute majority of the vote in the first round, then they're just declared president. But if uh, so, you have the first round and all the candidates from all the parties can run for president. And then the top two, if nobody reaches 50 percent, go to a runoff election where it's just the top two against each other. That way, there's no spoiler effect. And the president is a person who has the majority of at least uh, uh, of, of approval after the runoff. Now, Lula has a substantial lead, but he fell a percentage and a half short of the absolute majority. Although uh, some polls had suggested that Lula was going to win in the first round. So Lula, is uh, he was president for eight years. And he was in jail for uh, 560 days during the last year. But last year, uh, uh, the Supreme Court has annulled the convictions against him, and he was free to run this election because the last election he was in jail. So he couldn't run against Bolsonaro last election. So last election, we had Fernando Haddad against Bolsonaro representing Her audio Lula is and so the bad. Left. But this election, we had uh, Lula himself ra racing against Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro is a right-wing uh, candidate who leads lead the country the last three and a half years. And so overall, uh, most of the parties that uh, got like four or five percent, one is a center-left party and one is a centrist party. Uh, so <clears throat> they were mostly splitting the vote from Lula, although some percentage of their voters are probably going to vote for Bolsonaro. I would say on net, I would expect Lula to get about 53% in the head to head, 53 to 55. I had to predict. Uh, but whenever you have a runoff, weird shit can happen, man. Weird shit can happen in runoff. So you can't, you know... You can't count your chickens till they, you know, till they're hatched. And he was trying to get a second round. He has often said that the polls was misleading and the, the electoral system here in Brazil was not trustable. And he was uh, saying this even last night. He said there was some allegations of fraud. And, but of, of course, these allegations are not taken seriously. The electoral voting system in Brazil is trustable and the results were we, we knew the results in some hours but he says that to this uh, small uh, portion of the electorate in brazil that still believes that there's some uh, uh, chance 
of rigging the election. Mm. So that's what we are going to see in the second round. Uh, Bolsonaro against Lula, uh, left-wing uh, candidates trying to achieve the vote in the center of the dispute, and Bolsonaro trying to to come to to the center. Didn't the conservatives and Bolsonaro faction get a lot of seats in the Congress and Senate? Yeah, I would say that it was a pretty disappointing result overall for the Brazilian left, but not totally catastrophic. But yeah, definitely not not as positive as it could have been. Because the two candidates that... Are we allowed to disagree with Mike, or is it just saying anything against communism that gets permabanned? You're allowed to disagree with me. I don't ban people for that. <clears throat> I just think that, for the most part... If you are engaging in anti-communism in the year of our Lord 2022, your brain is priorities are completely whack. The biggest threats to the world peace right now are far are, are the far right, which is on ascendant everywhere. It is committing some of the most horrible atrocities around the world. Like, what are you even fucking talking about, man? Like, you you know, you should probably have your rhetoric being you know focused on the actual threat to like human life and the survival of the planet. If you're going like, oh man, a hundred years ago, this communist movement did this thing that I disagree with. Like, what are you, what are you fucking doing, man? It was in third and fourth place. They were uh, in center, center left and center right. So they are going to try to achieve this vote. Although are like... The mods banned someone for saying communism is worse. Oh, what was the ban? Who, who got banned? Who got banned? I don't see anybody getting banned. Am I crazy? A small portion of the vote, Simone Tebet and Ciro Gomez. Ciro had 3% of the vote. Simone had 4% of the vote. But these votes are Milo, going to be you, the 14 months. for uh, deciding who is going to be Brazil's next president. So I know, Bolsonaro, you talked about the polls suggesting that Bolsonaro was going to be trailing by more than he has been. Um, and he's ca he called the polls lies. Uh, and I'm curious about the impact of misinformation during this election because I know that was a big issue. Is the Bolsonaro overperforming narrative overblown? I'd say that his vote share was underestimated, but the polls were largely accurate. So like for pretty much every candidate, they pretty much hit except him. They underestimated his results a little bit, but they came out of like the undecided section and they largely went with Bolsonaro. It wasn't, a, it wasn't some sort of like shocking result. It was a slightly disappointing result if you wanted to see a huge Lula win, but it's not some sort of like, you know, crazy uh, overperformance by Bolsonaro. He's the incumbent and he's in the low 40s. That's a terrible performance. During the last election. Yeah, and last night what Bolsonaro said, the first one of the first things he said is that he proved. Chat, I'm sorry, this audio is too bad. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. The audio sucks too much. I can barely hear what she's saying. I'm losing focus. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the audio sucks. I have to pull her. I have to, I have to yoink her. We're going to go with different coverage. All right, be right back. Brazil's presidential election will be settled in a second round of voting on October the 30th. That's after no candidate took an absolute majority of votes on Sunday. With nearly all of the ballots counted, former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, who is simply known as Lula, has 48%, while incumbent Jair Bolsonaro received an unexpectedly strong 43%. Moderate Simone Tebet is trailing with 4%. Lula spoke to supporters in the commercial capital Sao Paulo, putting an optimistic spin on the result. I always believed that we would win these elections, and what I can tell you is that we are going to win these elections. This is just extra time for us. The race has proven tighter than most surveys suggested, revitalizing incumbent President Jair Bolsonaro's campaign after he insisted that polls could not be trusted. His surprising showing dashed Lula's hopes of a quick win. I think we will form a good alliance to win the elections. Well, Cristiana Amalho is from DW's Portuguese for Brazil's service. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, this result. I mean, we're going to have to wait a little longer, of course, to see what happens. But were you surprised? Yes, completely surprised, I guess. It was a big surprise for all the Brazilians. 
uh, the polls, the election polls, show a very different um, situation with Lula ahead from uh, Bolsonaro uh, with a big advantage. So now the analysts are trying to figure out what really happened. I would say there was a higher absence. Many people went, want, couldn't go to vote, um, like 20%. So I guess this could be because many uh, were fearing this political violence. Uh, and also we saw many queues, long, long, long time to vote. So many people probably just said we are not going to wait. So this changed maybe these results. Uh, Lula's currently ahead. He's led Brazil before. But tell us a little bit more about who he is. Yeah, he's, uh, union, he was a union, union leader and uh, very popular. Uh, his government in Brazil was really... He left the government with a huge popularity still. And after being accused of corruption, he was in jail. And then after the Supreme Court decided that this was not a fair uh, judgment, he was freed. And now he's the, the big hope for the Brazilians to defeat Bolsonaro. The, the followers from Lula uh, believed he, he would be the right person to do that, of course. You gave us a little bit of an idea about the... Um... Uh, the election atmosphere before. Um, what's the actual situation like in Brazil at the moment? What's the co political climate like uh, going into this next round of voting? Yeah, there is a big polarization and now it's going to go still further. The division in the society, I would say, we could expect for the second turn uh, more um, political violence, um, more fear from voting, also um, maybe attacks against the media, as we have seen, against the justice system from the Bolsonaro followers. And I would say that it's, it's now much more difficult uh, to Lula also to run for the second term. But um, at the same time, we had other candidates like Simone Tebet. Um, she could probably uh, go now uh, offer her, his, her support to, Bolsonaro, to Lula. Okay. Uh, sorry, so I guess uh, this could be... Uh, he could... Lula should... I'm so sorry. So suppression at polling places sounds like Iowa in 2020. Hopefully they don't have an app counting votes created by Bolsonaro's previous campaign staffers. Someone give uh, kids and Zen a sub. He suffered through eight ads. I'm so sorry, chat. I'm so sorry, chat. I didn't have the power to negotiate as well as Hassan did. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I did my best, chat. I did my best, okay? I did my best. But at a certain point, you got to grab the bag, all right? Vijay, uh, Prasad, and Chomsky on the election. Oh, this is really good. We're going to watch this. this we need much more support from the other candidates, too. Okay, so things are, could be looking good for Lula, not so good uh, for the voting atmosphere. It's Lord not Bacillus, the sort of atmosphere the you want that's conducive to, to a good election. But, uh, Christiana, thank you very much for coming in and bringing us your insight into this election. Thank you very much. I'm going to unsub and send one elevated message a month to maximize your money. If you wanted to maximize giving me money during the entire month of September, you should have subscribed for six months. I would have paid no fees at all on that subscription. A six month subscription done last month basically made it so I didn't have to pay any fees for six months. That was the best way. Also stay subscribed. That's, that's the best thing you can do. All right, we have some really exciting coverage of the election. Hold on. Chikuna. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Brazil's presidential election is headed to a runoff. In the first round of voting Sunday, Brazil's... Discount only applies for the month, not all six. Incorrect. Incorrect. If you bought a six-month sub in the month of September, it applied for all six months. But it's all in the past now. Former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva of the Leftist Workers' Party won 48 percent of the vote, beating Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, I who received 43 percent of the vote. It was a closer result than many projected, and Bolsonaro-backed candidates also perform well in other races. Lula addressed supporters Sunday night. 
To the disgrace of some, I have 30 more days to campaign. I love campaigning. I love going out on the street. I love rallying. I love getting on a truck. I love discussing with Brazilian society. This will be the first chance for us to have a face-to-face -face debate with the President of the Republic, to find out if he will continue to tell lies or if he will, at least once in his life, speak the truth to the Brazilian people. There is widespread fear in Brazil that Bolsonaro could stage a coup to stay in power. Already, this has been the violent election, most violent election campaign Brazil has seen in years. Bolsonaro spoke Sunday. We are going to form good alliances for us to win the election. I can't talk of it at the moment. While Lula won a plurality in Sunday's election, he did not win 50 percent in the 11-person race. So he now faces a runoff against Bolsonaro October 30th. Lula's running— This is probably the most important race in the entire world. This is the most important election that has ever happened in, like, the human species. <laughs> like, like, I hate to be, you know, going back to some really bad elections we had in the 30s. I, this is probably one of the most important elections that is ever going to happen because Lula represents a complete change. And it is, it's a big deal. Because Bolsonaro basically wants to deforest the Amazon and wants to enact a fascist uh, politic in Brazil, which is, one of, which is the largest country in Latin America by population and landmass. So... Whereas Lula wants to build a multinational, plural, pluralistic, left-wing society. He's basic, it's basically Hitler versus Bernie Sanders. Or Mussolini versus Bernie Sanders. And it's not just going to apply to Brazil, but the, the Amazon is one of the most important centers of carbon uh, and uh, absorption in the planet. It's a huge carbon sink. And if the Amazon is destroyed which many scientists have, have warned we're nearing a tipping point from a combination of climate change and deforestation. This is, I mean, this is, this is, it doesn't get more important than this. It doesn't get more important than this. Can you explain the corruption thing Lula got caught up in? It's not real. Basically, someone tried to accuse him of corruption and there was no evidence. They tried to say he got like a small apartment um, it turned out that the people that were behind the prosecution were all corrupt and the judges and prosecutors were behind the scenes trying to figure out any way they could get him. They were clearly biased and focused on disrupting his electoral prospects, his ability to run for election uh, and deny him. Uh, 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 so the Supreme Court reviewed the prosecution and found them to be completely uh, biased from the get go. Um, and so there's really no evidence. It's just a way of smearing him and be like, I heard he had some corruption, but it doesn't have any basis in reality. As some chatters and yourself have pointed out, the left did not, not do great in the Senate. Lula, the center left, will be gridlocked from accomplishing much of what they need to, especially with so many of the judges are stacked against the left. Bolsonaro really wouldn't even need to try a coup. Just bide his time. I don't know. I mean, I... I Based on what happened the last time Lula was in office, he was tremendously popular. And I feel like a lot of the fears about Brazil and, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, way that the campaign has shaked out is going to result in a... Like, when Bolsonaro is out of office and he's a fucking loser, his movement is going to collapse on a platform to reduce inequality, preserve the Amazon. Brazil is pretty much the most culturally and ethnically diverse country of the world, so you're absolutely right. This election would tell us what's coming in the world in the fight against fascism. Basically, Brazil is the most important country, you know, in Latin America to help shape what's going to happen. Is Latin America going to be a fascist hellhole, narco state? That's a laptop of an imperialist United States? Or is it going to be a fully developed region on par with Europe? and fighting for leftist and socialist and social democratic societies. It'll either be, that's the choice. An exploited region of devastated environmental damage and bloody killing fields or literally become on par with Europe. That's the question. 
Amazon rainforest and protect Brazil's indigenous communities after Bolsonaro dismantled environmental and indigenous protections. On Friday, Democracy Now!'s Juan González and I spoke about all of this with Vijay Prashad and Noam Chomsky, co-authors of a new book, The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan and the Fragility of U.S. Power. They've both been following the race in Brazil closely. Vijay Prashad is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He joined us from New York, but was just back from Brazil. And in Minas Gerais, Brazil, Noam Chomsky. Uh, spoke to us. He's a world-renowned political dissident, linguist and author, laureate professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Arizona and professor emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for he, where he taught for more than half a century. I began by asking Professor Chomsky what the election between Brazil's far-right president, Bolsonaro, and the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, means not just for Brazil, but for the world. It is very significant, not only for Brazil, but for the world in Brazil in many respects. But one of them is what you mentioned, the fate of the Amazon. Uh, most of the Amazon region is in Brazil. The, uh, of the two candidates, uh, one of them, the current president, Bolsonaro, uh, is basically committed to destroying the Amazon uh, under his years in office. There's been sharp acceleration with his approval of illegal logging, uh, mining, agribusiness, tax on the indigenous reserves. Uh, it's been known for some time that sooner or later, uh, if uh, destruction of the forest continues, there won't be enough moisture produced to reproduce the Amazon. It'll turn to savanna. Uh, regrettably, that's beginning to happen. Uh, satellite and other studies have shown that in corners of the Amazon in Brazil, it's already happening. Uh, tipping points may be coming soon, which would be irreversible. That's a catastrophe for Brazil. But, in fact, for the entire world, the Amazon forests are one of the major carbon sinks. Yeah, once you hit 80, it's over. You know, like, you can look and be healthy and vibrant throughout your 60s and 70s, but once you hit 80, it starts to, it catches up with you. It catches up with you. But I will say this, he's still cogent and he's still important to listen to even though I don't agree with everything. He's in his 90s now. Thanks. And it'll be soon become a carbon producer. Uh, that's devastating for the world. And those are Bolsonaro's policies. So for that reason alone, if, the, if he manages somehow to maintain power, perhaps by a military coup, uh, uh, it'll be... A, a disaster for the world. We might point out that there's a counterpart coming in the United States. The uh, Republican Party, of course, is a 100% denialist party committed to maximizing the use of fossil fuels, eliminating the regulations that somehow mitigate their effects. So they come back into power. Uh, again, hurtling towards disaster. So for those reasons alone, the next couple of months are of extreme significance. There are many other factors. Uh, the uh, business community in Brazil doesn't like Bolsonaro. He's too vulgar and uh, uh, corrupt, but... Uh, they like Lula even less because of his social democratic policies. So where they'll stand is not so clear. Also unclear is the nature of the military. Uh, the police, the various branches of the police, tend to be quite supportive of Bolsonaro. Uh, 
the military is split. Uh, there's been a heavy military component in his government, unprecedented in fact, but other elements of the top military command have been uh, ambiguous about their status. So that's naturally a reason for concern. But Bolsonaro has said openly and clearly uh, that uh, basically following Trump's line, probably with Trump's advisors on his... Uh, like, look at this shit, man. God, Bolsonaro sucks so bad, dude. At his elbow, saying that either he will win the election or the election was fraudulent and he won't accept it. In fact, he called all of the ambassadors to a special meeting to tell them that, which shocked the diplomatic community and did lead to negative responses. Whether he'll keep to that or not, and nobody really knows. So there is a kind of background tension in the atmosphere. But I Resistible cringe. should That's say the months, that from the little that we can see on the streets in the community, it looks pretty normal. So if there are concerns, they're not very openly expressed. There are Somebody said this is this really is the worst of humanity versus the best of humanity. And everybody's we all are depending upon what the Brazilian people find. Whether the Brazilian people decide that they want to have a incredibly successful president return to office who was one of the most successful in both developing uh, Brazil's economy as a whole, but also raising up the bottom. It was a bottom-up growth. So the rich people in Brazil did better than ever under Lula. But the poor people actually started to see their lives turning around. There was a true anti-poverty development and focus by Lula. Unions in Brazil surged in, and in power and popularity. And Brazil's economy, far from crashing, grew gangbusters. He was by far and away the most successful politician outside of Bol Bolivia and you know who. Also cooed by a far-right dipshits, but thankfully the power of the movement towards socialism in Brazil has returned. So this is, this is, this is where we're at, chat. It's basically... Brazilian Trump versus Brazilian Bernie. That's the simplest way to understand this election. If, I, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, under the Lula presidency, 30 million Brazilians were lifted out of poverty. Malnutrition was reduced by 70% and infant mortality by 47%. Yes. Ravel Institute made a video on how Lula eradicated extreme poverty. Yes, we should do that. Yes, we should pull that and watch that. It was a major debate. Uh, went on for hours. What does it suggest about U.S. involvement if Juan Guaido is posting in support of Bolsonaro? That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know about the CIA and who they want to win. Incredible. Deforestation of the Brazilian Amazon accelerated under President Bolsonaro. This is Lula. Lula's track record on when he came into office, he, he, uh, he cut deforestation of brazil the amazon rainforest in brazil by 80 percent in his term in office so i mean it's just shocking man uh, there's demonstrations and so on so the whole matter is very much in people's minds clearly but uh, the, if the polls are anywhere near accurate the lula might win on the first round but almost certainly would on the second. But then there's the open question of how uh, Bolsonaro and the forces behind him would, would react to this. So we now know that unfortunately Lula didn't win in the first round, although he has a huge lead. Bolsonaro did perform slightly better than expected. But just so you have more of a context of why I say this race is so important, this is a video from Gravel Institute about uh, Lula's presidency. Americans generally think of Brazil as a country of beaches, jungles, and Christ the Redeemer, a friendly tourist destination with fun and festivity. But Brazil isn't just a nice spot for a there vacation. No functioning. It's one of the most unequal countries in the world. It's also a country with one of the most successful socialist movements of our time. In 1888, 
Brazil abolished slavery, the last country in the Americas to do so. But even after a republic was established in 1889, elites excluded most people from voting, using their power to enrich themselves and their families. For decades, Brazil was a textbook oligarchy based on coffee with milk politics, a reference to the agrarian economies of the two most influential states. The government acted above all to protect elite interests while millions languished in poverty. As Brazil urbanized, peasants flocking to cities could see prosperity around them, but couldn't reach it. They built sprawling informal settlements called favelas, stark illustrations of the country's disparity. By the early 1960s, an alternative vision emerged based on land redistribution and expanded democracy. Communists, peasants, workers, and students supported this reformist push. But then, fearing a communist takeover, the United States and local elites supported a military coup. From 1964 to 1985, Brazil was ruled by a brutal dictatorship that killed and tortured thousands of people. But by the late 1970s, something was changing. Workers noticed their wages were not keeping pace with the rising cost of living. It turned out they were getting paid significantly less than the regime led on. So, led by a combative, charismatic union leader named Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, commonly known as Lula, workers in the industrial heartland around São Paulo went on strike. Lula understood well the indignities of the working class. His parents were illiterate peasants who struggled to give their kids a better life. And he didn't learn to read until he was 10. When he was 18, he crushed his pinky in a workplace accident. By the time he was seen by a doctor four hours later, there was no choice but to amputate the finger. Driven by these experiences, Lula and those around him realized that workers needed their own political party. So in 1980, they created the Partido dos Trabalhadores, the Workers' Party. It was the first party in Brazil created for workers by workers. The Workers' Party grew quickly. And in 2002, after three failed attempts, Lula was elected president. In office, Lula recognized that Brazil's fundamental problem was the grinding poverty and inequality that previous governments had mostly ignored. So in 2003, Lula's administration introduced Bolsa Família, the family stipend. Basically, the government would guarantee an income to families in extreme poverty, those earning less than $17 per person per month. And when poor families over the official poverty line were expecting a child or had a child below 18, they would get extra income too. As long as families get vaccinations and keep their kids in school, they can receive benefits indefinitely. There's no mandatory drug testing and no work requirement. With this guaranteed monthly income, poor families can meet their basic needs and afford safer living conditions. The program doesn't provide a lot by American standards. Most families receive about $38 a month. But for the neediest Brazilians, it has been transformational. Compared to what other countries were doing, the scale of Bolsa Família was incredible. In the 1990s, U.S. President Bill Clinton had implemented welfare reform. He made it more difficult to access government benefits. Promising to end welfare as we know it, he instituted work requirements and drug tests. It became so complicated and humiliating to secure government assistance that many Americans who needed support received no help at all. Extreme poverty soared. Brazil's radical experiment, meanwhile, had the exact opposite effect. Bolsa Família quickly became an international success story. For one thing, it dramatically reduced poverty. By 2015, the percentage of the population living below the international poverty line had dropped from 13% to just three. Bolsa Família helped lift over 40 million people out of extreme poverty. In one of the most unequal countries in the world, it has cut wealth inequality by as much as 20%. Bolsa Familia has also significantly reduced child labor and improved educational outcomes for the poorest children. Studies suggest the program has helped lower rates of domestic violence, postpartum depression, suicide, and even tooth decay in children. Bolsa Familia isn't just a cash transfer program. It's a successful attempt to wrestle with a legacy of social neglect. For many Brazilians, Bolsa Família is the most tangible example of the state acting on their behalf. It represents- yeah, Somebody just said 40 million people is the population of Ukraine. 40 million people is the population of Ukraine. And that's how many people that Lula lifted out of extreme poverty. It's the very promise of citizenship. It directly attacks poverty in the present, enabling families to invest in their children's future. 
Lula left office in 2010 as one of the most popular leaders on earth, and by far the most popular in Brazilian history. Bolsa Família was a major reason for that. In fact, when a far-right extremist won the presidency in 2018, he sought ways to rebrand the program as his own. So while the United States sought to push people out of poverty by forcing them off welfare, socialists in Brazil did the exact opposite. They opened government support to more people. In the US, poverty went up. In Brazil under Lula, poverty shrunk, inequality fell, and the economy grew to five times the size than when Lula took office. Now, Brazil is- So chat, is taxation and redistribution did not result in Brazil's economy collapsing, and in fact grew f much faster than previous administrations under far-right governments. Surprise, surprise, capitalists are bad at capitalism. Still marked by serious inequality. But the Workers' Party showed that governments can act to dramatically reduce poverty. The first step is recognizing that poor people don't become less poor if their government calls them lazy or makes them take a drug test just to afford groceries. Enable families to meet their material needs and they'll lead better lives. Lula remains popular in Brazil because he acknowledged that everyone deserves a dignified life, regardless of their class or income. And as we confront the rot that prosperous elites in this country have allowed to fester for too long, we might learn something from the example of the Workers' Party in Brazil. I'm Andre Paglarini, professor of history and Latin American studies at Dartmouth for the Gravel Institute. You would think the capitalist class would love that, but they only care about short-term profit over stable long-term capitalism a death cult. Well, it's not just, see, the capitalists don't want the economy to grow. Capitalists understand that they have unearned status. They get it. Capitalists, when they look at their bank account and realize that their wealth just grew by millions through no act of their own, they feel, they know it's wrong. They know they stole the money. And like every other bandit in history, they try to keep it secret. It's not about, well, wow, this is, uh, this is making the economy grow faster. I thought you liked economic growth. Or, oh, wow, this is cutting poverty. They don't care about that. They're worried about working class people getting politically engaged and aware. You know, the first thing you do when you get politically engaged is give labor rights or you end child poverty. You build these programs. And, and then eventually, as the power of the working class grows, as more and more people are like, wait a minute, what do you do for your money, capitalist? That's what they're scared of. They're scared of getting caught. So it doesn't matter if every single empirical measurement shows that leftist policy is better. They don't give a fuck. They'd rather be the king of the ashes than an equal in paradise. That's it. All right, let's go back to covering this. Well, that's pretty much the current situation. Well, Noam Chomsky, uh, f following up on that, the, uh, the the significance politically for Latin America and the world of, uh, of a, a Lula victory, given the fact that we've seen now Latin America go from the early pink tide of the early 2000s, then there President was a Biden resurgence of right-wing government and lawfare actions throughout the region. And now we're seeing almost every major country uh, in uh, Latin America uh, voting in uh, left-wing governments, uh, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, Ar Argentina, Peru, uh, and Brazil, of course, is the largest country. This is a region with uh, no nuclear weapons, with no major uh, armed conflicts uh, uh, in the region right now. What would Lula coming to victory mean for the consolidation of uh, this, uh, this left-wing trend in Latin America? Yes, you can add. Chile to the list. Uh, uh, Brazil is, of course, the largest, most important uh, country in South and Latin America. And the direction in which Brazil goes is sure to have a major impact on these tendencies that you describe. Of course, there are 
bitterly opposed by the most of the business world, by the uh, invest, international investment community. Uh, what happens in Brazil could be certain to have a large-scale effect on whether these this mildly left social democratic uh, tendency will continue to develop and evolve. That's very important on the international scene as well. It'll, for example, affect the character of uh, uh, BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, uh, India, China, South Africa, and now Indonesia, uh, developing for independent, possibly independent force in. Thanks for e-doctoring my mom. You're welcome. That's our comrades. Global affairs. You're welcome. Buddy. During the early years of the century, when uh, Lula was in power, uh, he managed to uh, give uh, the BRICS uh, alignment a significant role in early world affairs. In fact, Brazil became perhaps the most respected uh, country inter internationally under Lula and his. Uh, Foreign Minister Celso Amorim, and if he returns to office, that could give an impetus to uh, the develop the further development of BRICS as a quite significant element in international affairs. Mm. That's connected with much broader tendencies, uh, much broader issues about uh, multipolarity and unipolarity and international affairs. Uh, the United States, of course, is working hard to maintain what's called a, a, a unilateral world order. Uh, other elements in the world, uh, other components of the world are not going along with that. Uh, Ukraine is a central part of that issue. About 90 percent of the countries of the world are not going along with the uh, U.S.-U.K. position on Ukraine, which is basically uh, continue the war to weaken Russia and no negotiations. Uh, even in Europe, like in Germany, that's not accepted. About over to three quarters of the German population wants to move to negotiations now. Uh, all of these things are taking place in the background, and what's happening in Brazil will have a significant impact on the direction in which they go. So there are many large issues at stake, also just domestically in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has extraordinary inequality, kind of like the United States in that respect. Uh, enormous amount. It's a, potentially a very rich country. A century ago, it was called... Uh, the Colossus of the South has never been realized, part because of the avarice of the uh, wealthy sector, which has basically no commitment to the country. Uh, and that will move in one or the other direction, depending on the outcome of this election. So there is quite a lot at stake. Oh, yeah. Kim Kardashian just got fined a million dollars, chat. Oh, fear cuts deeper. What did they ask? He said, how did Lusa lose power if it was so good under him? Oh, he stepped down uh, in 2010 and let somebody else in his party run, uh, is the actual answer. And then later on, uh, there was this huge attempt. Because Lula's successor uh, was not as popular as him, They basically the United States cooked up false uh, corruption charges. Uh, and this is one of the standard things they do, right? Like, if you see a government that's massively outperforming every other country in the world in economic growth and income inequality reduction, the first thing you want to do is make uh, bald-faced lies about corruption. Uh, and that way you can attack using what's called lawfare. They practice lawfare against the Brazilian Workers' Party. Um, and uh, that's it. And that was hand-in-hand -hand with the United States of America to try to get you know, exploitative relations and unequal exchange back in Brazil. Locally in Brazil, in Latin America altogether, as you mentioned, and even globally, because of the role of the 
Latin American countries, Brazil and Thanks, Italy, Brittany. in uh, uh, setting the stage for the, the next phase of global order. Noam Chomsky, on the issue of Bolsonaro— And presidents can't serve more than two consecutive terms in Brazil. They can serve non-executive terms. Um, perhaps not accepting election results, and he is in charge of the elections now as president. Earlier in the campaign, he said, only God will remove me from power. The army is on our side. It's an army that doesn't accept corruption, that doesn't accept fraud. Um, are you concerned that he will not accept the election? And also, how much has Trump and his rejection of the elections and spreading the big lie? influence Bolsonaro, empowered him? Well, Trump is uh, his ideal, and there's good reason to suppose that Trump's circle of advisors mm -hmm. is playing a role in Bolsonaro's current decision-making, as they pretty clearly did in the 2018 election, which he managed to win. But uh, on reasons we don't have time to go through, uh, so uh, he might try to follow the Trump model. Uh, his appeal, his statement about uh, only God can remove him, is a Trump-like appeal to a large sector of his voting base. Uh, a large sector of his voting base is evangelicals, uh, right wing. Christian groups, much as in the United States and Trump. So references to God are obligatory. Uh, Any takes on AMLO in Mexico? I never see him involved or referenced in North America or international media since election. Even the previous president, Enrico, was referenced in U.S. media with Trump was working on border policy. Uh, AMLO is a very complicated, I would call him a syncretic figure. Uh, but overall, on net, a challenge to American power, so therefore good. Uh, but he has like he's he's very idiosyncratic and kind of weird. Charges that the PT uh, the Liz party will undermine the church. Uh, all of these uh, uh, charges, which we're familiar with in the United States, are part of the Bolsonaro campaigning. Uh, what he'll do, we don't know. No, uh, they're. Uh, the large majority of the population in Brazil, according to the polls, is concerned, seriously concerned, that there might be violence uh, at the top time of the elections or in the aftermath. So this concern, there's reason for it. Uh, the alliance with the Republican Party, the Trump owns Republican Party, is pretty clear, it's not Brother. hidden. So there are similarities in the United States and Brazil. I mean, Bolsonaro and the Trumps are close personal friends. <laughs> like what? Uh, that are certainly worth uh, merit attention. Uh, Vijay Prashad, I'd like to bring you into the discussion here on Brazil. Um, you were there recently. Uh, your assessment of the importance of this election and also um, to what degree is the, is the electorate voting for Lula uh, and the Workers' Party or uh, pre predominantly for Lula? There have been some reports that the, his popularity is much greater than that of the Workers' Party because of all of the uh, years of corruption scandals that occurred while the party was in power. I'm wondering your views on those two things. It's great to be with you, um, and it's great to have known from Sao Paulo, from Minas Gerais. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is Lula is an extraordinary person, an extraordinary campaigner, an extraordinary politician. Um, you know, these things matter. I covered Lula's first election campaign when he first won um, in the 2000s, was in Brazil during his second um, uh, presidency, and covered this year 
some of his rallies and public appearances, and also had the opportunity to briefly speak with him. He is an extraordinary person. He's extraordinarily charismatic, touches the hearts of people. Uh, this is what I suppose in the United States is called retail politics. Also, Lula is this time running to the left of Lula, the president. He's made it very clear um, that questions of social justice will be at the forefront of his presidency. He's made it clear that he once again wants to have Brazil be an important player in the process of South American integration and in the revival of the BRICS. Now, it's really important that we concentrate on the attempts to undermine Lula. It's the military, of course, but you've got to pay attention to the fact, as Juan said earlier, this issue of lawfare is on the table. One of the things I learned in talking to Fernando Haddad, who ran for president in 2018 and is now running to be the governor of Sao Paulo state, what Haddad told me is that the key issue in this election is, yes, to elect Lula, but also to get an impeachment proof majority in the legislature. Because what happened to President Dilma Rousseff is on the minds of everybody. You can win an election, you can push an agenda, but you will get removed by a legislature which is committed to a very right-wing politics. And to somehow drive a impeachment-proof legislature is important. And that's where the uh, assessment about the Workers' Party comes in. Is the party going to be strong enough to elect its candidates across the country, uh, or will it again rely merely on winning the presidency? So that first issue of winning in the legislature is key. You know, when Lula comes to office this time, he has already pledged to start a conversation about, for instance, a Latin American currency called the Sur. This was tried previously under, under Hugo Chavez called the Sucre. But the Sur, if Brazil puts its considerable resources behind it, it's going to be a really important development for Latin America. And, you know, we need to understand that, as Noam said, the mood in the world is contrary to being pushed around by the United States or its allies. People are looking for some other kind of leadership. And the respect that Lula has, uh, which the other leaders let's say, in the BRICS countries don't have, that respect that Lula has. Lula is the first Brazilian president whose name is known in other countries in the global south. He's going to leverage that respect um, to drive a multilateral agenda in world affairs. I think that's going to be of great significance and importance. Again, when he came to power in the 2000s, the mood was not like that around the world. Now we see the mood in South Africa, even in India, governed by a right-wing government. Um, the government has said, look, we are Maybe not going to involve months, ourselves buddy. in Europe's wars. We have our own problems. We have our own conflicts. And I believe that a presidency from Lula, a revival of the BRICS, will allow some of that mood to be captured by somebody who comes to um, world affairs with a great deal of, of uh, legitimacy and, and love and, and, in a sense, uh, respect. And Vijay, following up uh, on that, the uh, the issue of the uh, a greater, a more multilateral world that that you mentioned. Uh, one of the things that's happened in Latin America in the recent decades is in the increasing visibility and investment of uh, China uh, uh, throughout Latin America, allowing many of these governments, whether of the right or the left, to be more independent of, of financing and loans and investment from uh, the U.S. and Europe. I'm wondering. Your sense of, again, if a Lula victory, what would happen in terms of this trend of China getting more involved in Latin America's economies? Well, it's important to say that even during the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro, um, China continued to be a major trading partner with Brazil. And Mr. Bolsonaro was very careful not to come out with any kind of frontal attack on China. Uh, let's be quite clear that the arrival of Chinese commercial economic ties with most countries in Latin America is inevitable. It's clear, you know, there's a reason why a 
country like Argentina joined China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that's because the Chinese have investment capital available. The Chinese have a large market for the commodities produced in Latin America. In a way, China is offering much more to these countries in terms of trade, development, investment, and so on than the United States. That's just a fact. The question is that in the last period, from Trump onward, the United States has attempted to tell countries in Latin America that they should stop trading with China. This is what happened with uh, El Salvador, for instance, over a deal uh, for a Pacific port. The United States tried to impose on the government of El Salvador and, in fact, succeeded uh, to break a deal with the Chinese. Interesting thing is China is not telling anybody to break deals with the United States. In fact, Argentina, a Belt and Road partner, uh, went back to the IMF this year. A very poor deal, by the way, and, and it's a deal that requires far more scrutiny, once more austerity on the Argentinian people. But Lula has made it clear they're going to continue in that sense Bolsonaro's policy of trading with China. But there'll be a kind of friendlier attitude to China. And, and I, I'm very much hopeful that if there's a revitalization of the BRICS, this attempt to demonize countries in Eurasia, particularly China, uh, will find less of an audience than it finds even now. Um, it's quite unfortunate that the United States has ramped up a kind of demonization policy, suggesting that, you know, the Chinese are out there to steal people's privacy and so on. This is not a credit line of argument in countries where the Chinese have come, put money on the table through the People's Bank of China, done currency swaps and so on, and said, you don't need to do austerity. Here's investment money. It's not credible when the United States comes there and says, you know, China is here to steal your house. Um, that's not a credible argument. But it does create a lot of instability. It creates a lot of tension um, for countries. And I think if Lula comes to power, or not just Lula, we see this already with Gustavo Petro in Colombia. You know, when people come to power of that ilk uh, who want an independent foreign policy for their country, they understand that next year, 2023, is the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. They want to go beyond the Monroe Doctrine. You remember, Joe Biden said that Latin America is not the United States' backyard, it's the United States' front yard. For God's sake, President Biden, Latin America is nobody yard. These are sovereign countries that must be permitted to produce their own relations, whether it's for trade or political relations. The United States cannot continue uh, to essentially, as Noam says, be the godfather and tell countries what to do. Vijay Prashad and Professor Noam Chomsky, who's currently in Brazil, co-authors of the new book, The Withdrawal. The Brazilian runoff election between Lula and Bolsonaro will take place October 30th. Next up, we'll talk with them about Ukraine in 30 seconds. Well, chat, that is, uh, that's very important information. Basically, the idea of the development of, of Latin America from a place of massive exploitation to achieving, uh, you know, e equality with the Euro, you know, the European and American nations and actually being able to assert their own foreign policy, their own uh, uh, domestic policy away from U.S. interference. And the Monroe Doctrine basically says that no foreign power but the United States could interfere in the Americans. Implicitly, you know, the inference of that is the U.S. can influence uh, the politics of Latin American countries. Have you seen Elon Musk's peace proposal for the Ukraine war? Have you ever personally emailed Nome? No. Redo elections of annex regions under UN supervision. Russia leaves if that is the will of the people. Crimea, formerly part of Russia, as it has been since 18, 1783. Water supply to Crimea assured. Ukraine remains neutral. Chat, if that's what we did, there would have never been a war. This is literally just, I mean, this is what Russia was proposing prior to the war in Ukraine, so... He's literally just saying, give Russia what they want, for the most part. Are you watching the stream unsubbed? You're making income inequality worse. You are doing anti-praxis. We are the only Twitch stream that will not accept scam advertisers, and I will never fuck you over by selling you crap.